Hello? Hello! Are you there? It's Sims and Lufko, episode 142. Woo! 142. Shout out to Rob. Rob Barabee. Barabee. Rob Barabee. My tight end from high school. Really? The number two, three. Went to Princeton, played football there. Avid yes. listener of the Avid pod. Avid listener, yes. We appreciate you. Yeah, he loved when we brought up, like, you know, Greg Olson, Ramapo, oh, Wayne yeah, Hill yeah. stuff a few weeks uh, ago. I actually, last night, I did a Seahawks Scouts podcast. Did you really? I did. How was that? It was actually really enjoyable. We cool. talked about the Seahawks. We talked about how amazing Russell Wilson is. Awesome. How unfair they've treated him. Yes. And how the Eagles are going to beat them on Sunday. Yep. Well, uh, good, it was good. a good time. They yeah. want to have you on, of course. What up, Seahawks Scout? I think off season is when you'll have more available. Definitely. I'll, I'll and maybe do it. we'll all do it together. Yeah, that we should. We, we definitely should. Because he's been there since day one. Him did and you, Bajan. Did you get the gist that people there in Seattle are finally going like, wow, Russell Wilson is amazing? Oh, well, they clearly were they they, they believe were doing we believe yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, they were saying though that the offensive line has been getting better as of late right which i agree it, it had really no place else to go <laughs> uh yeah. it's for me though it's just a philosophy thing and that's right. something we always do uh 42s barry church is the first one that comes to barry my mind. church let me cross him off the list uh alteron verner alteron is right verner. now for the miami dolphins wow i played with him in tennessee so i'm not going to forget about him great 42s of all time of course we talked about ronnie lott ronnie ronnie uh i man. have his jersey do you really yes the eagle i mean the 49ers one 49ers yeah. white with red numbers i got it from china uh so i got like a, it's like authentic but it's not really authentic. right uh jackie robinson of course we said that the other day right. mariano rivera oh that would be my other 42 i know i'm missing some other ones in football though but go ahead currently right now right. patrick demarco right. morgan burnett ben gideon on uh minnesota carl joseph huh. uh Damn. chris marigo special teams guy for the eagles right. delano hill bishop sankey but here's the question what team is bishop sankey on Holy Sims. Shit. Bishop Sankey was the first running back taken, what, two years ago? He was uh, three yeah, years out of ago? Washington. He wore 25 at first, but man, 40. Where is he now, Sims? Gosh. I saw him on a, he's on the injured reserve for he's a team. He's not on the Cleveland Browns. No, he's on the Minnesota Vikings. Damn, that's amazing. I had no idea. Me neither. Bishop I did, did Sankey. Remember it. Big time draft pick. Okay, all time 42s Ben Jarvis Green Ellis. Yeah. Marcus Coleman, safety. Right. Kwame Lasseter. Gosh. I just loved Kwame Lasseter's Holy name, cow. Arizona defensive back. Uh, now an ESPN analyst, but oh. when he played on the Browns, Lewis Riddick Lewis wore 42. Riddick was 42. Darren Sharper who was a great player and apparently a really shitty human being. A horrible human being. I mean, just disgusting. Just disgusting. Talk about a guy that I thought was going to be a broadcasting like right. gangster. He right. had the look. He had the voice. Uh, he turned out to be a gangster, all right. Disgusting. Yes. Uh, guys that I had not really heard of, Chuck Muncie, running back for the uh, the Saints. Yeah. Gerald Riggs, running back for the Atlanta Falcons in the 80s, three-time Pro was Bowler. was also on the Redskins. Was Gerald he? Riggs. He was a good player, yes. Uh, and then Johnny Robinson was a Kansas City running back that became a defensive back, six-time All-Pro, and he won Super Bowl IV with wow. Kansas City. Okay, I didn't and then know all-time guys, Ronnie Lott, Paul Warfield. Oh, man, how did I forget about Hall him? Hall of Fame wide receiver for Cleveland and right, Miami. Right. And then Charlie Taylor, Hall of Fame uh, running back and wide receiver in the 60s, 70s, eight-time pro bowler. Uh, Quarterback of- Charlie Connerly, 42 for the Giants back in the day. Wow, that's the one that your son no, loves. Sunday. Yes, right. And then NBA's got a lot. Recent guys, Tony Allen, Nene Hilario, Al Horford, Kevin Love, Robin Lopez. Uh, 90s guys, yeah. Vin Baker, Elton Brown, PJ, Elton Brand, PJ Brown, Sam Mitchell, Theo Ratliff, Jerry Stackhouse, my Sixers, yeah. Lance Thomas, your Knicks, right. Kevin Willis, Shavlik Randolph from right. Duke. And then older guys, Lorenzen Wright, Connie Hawkins, Mike Jaminski, and James Worthy. It's actually, man, James Worthy, wow. Uh, it's actually amazing there's not more football stars with 42. I mean, to me, like, if I was a safety in the NFL. So my thought was that would be when one of the someone numbers. as good as Ronnie Lott takes a number, yeah. do you even want to try and compete? Well, I mean, then that would that doesn't hold true to the number 12 at quarterback. Or 20. There's a right? lot of good defensive backs. I mean, backs 12 is ridiculous. 21. One is ridiculous. Yeah, whenever we get to 12, it's insane. 12, the, 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 uh, I mean, there's like 20 quarterbacks that have won the Super Bowl wearing 12. It's I mean, good, Stallback, it's a, it's Rogers, a pretty looking number. Brady, Cunningham. Rogers. I mean, it just goes on, on and on. Uh, Second Amendment, Kyle Shanahan is our favorite coach in the NFL. What up? Uh, the news is quite simple. He has appointed the Tan Wonder, the next Joe Montana, Mon- <laughs> Jimmy Garoppolo. Yes. It's official. 
Uh, he goes in there, throws a touchdown, which is just – it was just perfect. Yeah, what is Beathard's status for this week, first Garoppolo of all? Garoppolo starting. I know he's – I know just uh, with the injury. I do not I mean, know. Yeah. I don't know how he got hurt. He got taken down by Michael Bennett. His, his knee got hurt. And his, his whole head body whiplash right. down. But Garoppolo. Yeah. So we get to evaluate him the rest of the year, which I'm, is pretty fun. I'm glad we're going to get to see him. I haven't watched that film yet, Lefko, but just the plays I saw at the end of the game, I mean – Clearly the talent's there. Clearly he's better than C.J. Beathard. So, uh, yeah, make the move now. And this is a game that they can steal. They can steal a game in Chicago. This will be a close game. Chicago's better than they are. Their defenses can definitely hang with uh, Trubisky. Exactly right. There's So it's a good matchup for them. And, yes, and the Bears, Chicago's beat up. They're beat when up. When they lost Leonard Floyd before the Eagles game, mm -hmm. uh, he was a huge factor. Right. They're a very staunch front seven. I don't think they're great at getting to the quarterback. No, no Akeem yeah. Hicks can. Yes, the, you know they're they're a really good front seven. The, their biggest problem is they don't get the luxury of ever getting help because they right. play. They're very conservative with their secondary still because they don't have great cover guys. So you know they're one of those teams that they they don't always want to blitz because they don't trust anybody man yeah. to man in the background those kind of things. Kyle can can with his great game plan design, kind of make, make their front seven a mute point and take away some of their strengths with all his misdirection yeah. stuff and great run game and all that stuff. So You're Garoppolo, excited for Jimmy G. I am. I, I like Jimmy G. I mean, he's really – I didn't love him coming out of the draft, uh, but he impressed me in preseason and what he did a little bit last year to start for Brady. Do you think he'll be a good Kyle guy? I do. I think he's a really good fit for Kyle. Like To me, and I haven't had this conversation with Kyle. More I think than Kirk Cousins? I do. I think his skill set fits better than Kirk Cousins would, yes. Um, so, of course, we're going to have Phil Sims on later. Uh, at the end of the show, I had a quick little interview with T.J. Watt uh, and his impressions about the first time that he met James Harrison, which was pretty cool. Right. Uh, coming up tomorrow after the pick show, we just had a sit down with Moose Daryl Moose Johnston, and that was fun talking about the Cowboys and all that. Uh, next week, we are going to have uh, – I did a quick interview with Brandon Cooks, and then Wednesday we had a conversation today with Isaac Bruce. That I thought was awesome. It was. It was, it was cool. like 35 minutes. It was so good that Fendrick and I have decided we're going to release that next Wednesday. It'll be another bonus episode like the one I had this Wednesday with Eric Ebron. Right. Ebron was great. I asked him if he wipes front to back or back to front. He refused to answer the question. Wow. Shitty balls, huh? I, well, who wipes back to front? I mean, I, I've known people over time, and it's disgusting. I don't really understand it. but Should we talk Eli and then rehash it with your pops, or should we save it for right beforehand? Let's just save it right before. Okay, so we have some other stuff to get to right. because the big news of the week, obviously, Eli uh, benching, announcing he was benching, all that stuff. Uh, Crabtree, have you seen his quotes? No. So we vilified him for starting the fight. Then it came out later that he tried to tape down the necklace. Right. He came out and said, I'm just playing ball. ESPN said that I taped the chain to myself before the game because I was worried about it. I didn't. I don't care about no chains. I am just playing ball, not worried about nothing. I don't like how the whole thing flipped, and now I'm the bad guy. He took my chain off, and I blocked him to the whistle. Yeah, I blocked him to the ground, but I didn't jump on him. They jumped on me. It was seven against one. And he went on to say that Tlaib started this last year and laughed with the media. Yeah, I, I get it. And, and I'm not totally blaming him. First of all, he didn't block to the whistle. He blocked far off the, after the whistle, and he blocked him 10 yards out of bounds. And so it's all justified. Again, I don't really care about the chain thing. That has nothing to do with it. There's no rule against, oh, you're not allowed to rip your chain off. You want to wear a chain off? Uh, I'm just telling you, I would be like a keep to leader, Jalen Ramsey, if I was a corner. I would rip that shit off every week if you wore that in front of me. I would be like, what? Okay. There was a guy on Thanksgiving who had a chain that was like dangling to his belly button. I would rip it off. But the thing is where I think people are missing this because I heard, saw like Jack Del Rio's tweet, right, where A.J. Green and Jalen Ramsey. It got Ramsey, reduced to a one-game suspension. I know. Man. I saw that. But, but to me, the reason A.J. Green, first of all, he should have been suspended in my eyes because he took down Jalen Ramsey from behind and could have hurt him. But the other reason I think people are missing in this conversation is – that happened in the center of the field. This started to endanger other people other than the players. 
There was on the side. There was a referee that got knocked down. There was cameramen that almost got hit by swinging helmets. Right. It became an issue. That's when it becomes bigger than you're just kicked out of the game. So they deserve the suspension, both of them. I'm just gonna say this: the thing that annoyed me is I don't like when they go to the CBS crew or the Fox crew, and it's these old guys sitting in a studio, and they all become holier than thou. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Nate Burleson comes on and goes, "This is disrespecting the Shield," and Bill Cowher's like, "Can't have." that in my game and I'm like Bill you know damn well that you would have been in the locker room as a Steelers coach going I need fire I need all this stuff I just think that no it's all it always becomes people in the booth demeaning people on the field there's never like oh we're gonna give them credit and maybe the emotions are high and this is a game where you're gonna kill each other yeah. everyone's like how could they not be thinking of the fans and every time I'm like you're so fucking out of touch I just to me it's it's so easy to have that opinion, and I think they're paid to have different opinions, but instead they go up there and they act like everybody's grandparents. I, I, I Listen, I hear you. It, it goes back to like what we talk about. I feel like we talk about this 10 times a year where we just go, you can't win as an athlete. Now Ever. you have two guys that care, and, oh, they care too much. Perfect example. Robbie Anderson catches that long touchdown, right. and then on the sideline the camera comes over, and like we've seen a million times, the player comes up to the camera, says something, but this time they turn the audio on. Yeah. And he said, hey, man, Man, vote for me for the Pro Bowl, please. And then Chris Spielman right afterwards goes, I mean, come on. you got to be thinking about the team right now, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets relayed to Coach Todd Bowles after the game. He goes, you know, that was selfish. And I'm going, this motherfucker can't win. Here he goes and catches a touchdown. He's riding emotions. It's the spur of the moment. You put the camera in there, and he goes, hey, man, vote for me for the Pro Bowl. Do you think that each route he's going, oh, man, this better get me in the Pro Bowl. So when someone looks in the camera and says, hi, Mom, should we then go, I can't believe he's thinking about his mom at a time like this. you got to focus on the team. Give the kid a break. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't like the whole Pro Bowl thing. Like, to me, that's not I understand, but we're right acting timing. like it's Winston Churchill and he has a speech prepared for every time the camera's I, on. I get it, but he's also acting like he's Randy Moss or Terrell Owens, and you're not yet. So just he score is balling, the touchdown. Though. He is a baller. He needs no a doubt. haircut, but he's balling. <laughs> he, he's a, he is a baller. He really is. He is legitimately like solidifying himself as a legitimate maybe a, option. Yeah, like maybe a legit number one. He's seriously I there. felt the same way. I was watching Jay Ajayi, and, and it, there started to be a little fiasco in Philadelphia right. because after the game, they're like, hey, what do you think about your role? And he said, listen, I do what I'm told. The coaches give me the ball, and I do it. Right. But he didn't say it with a smile. And so after Sunday, right. people started going, oh, you know what? Just shut up and tote the rock. And I'm like, when he came from Miami as a, quote, possible problem, the perfect quote that he would have given was, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And the coaches, right. players can't win. No, you can't. Ever. Not this day and age. I mean, unless you're – and then if you're J.J. Watt, you're called corny. You know, like there's no yeah. there's no way to do no. it. Uh, Josh Gordon, did you see the story about him? Well, what about him? His redemption tour, MMQB did a story on him, and a lot of it was how his agent is kind of controlling. Right. But the other thing was that he estimated that while he was in college, he was making $10,000 a month selling weed. Oof. It's a I lot did, of weed. That is a lot of weed. Well, Apparently it was in the seven-pound region. I mean, that um – is he the first player in college or NFL history to sell weed on the side? No, he's not. Okay, let's just keep that real right there. Yeah. Uh, the Baylor. Did you uh, ever experience any of that? I know I'm guys sure. that were involved in that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yes, definitely. And, and a lot of times too, what happens? I I experience it more in the NFL because what really what happens too is guys try to support their friends, right? And now okay, there's a player who's come from nothing. And he has some friends that he grew up with that are like his family, exactly. right? Exactly. Because maybe he didn't have a mom or a dad, or he was raised by, you know, his uncle or his grandfather. Or he's the only one from the neighborhood to go to college. Right. So he's got friends that are around him who are like his brothers. I mean, they are truly like that. So now the player has a little extra money. He throws them some cash. Yes. And this is what they do on the side. They might sell some weed or whatever to get some cash for themselves. That's That definitely goes on. And let's come on. I mean, we didn't. Did you really think Baylor was really one of the most stand-up no. institutions we've ever seen? Let's go through your games because I'm going to put off, push off this Eli conversation. Uh, your game notes. First one up, Rams, Saints. Rams, or Saints. Michael Thomas. Still don't know why he went in the first round. Can't get by anybody. Nobody. I just, I don't. Know he, that he's a first-round pick in fantasy. 
Uh, yeah, well, because his stats are going to be great, but they have to do everything to get him the ball or try to get him open. It's all play design. So there's nothing there athletically that I go, ooh, he's special. Like nobody's going, we have to double Michael Thomas because our corners are mm. really physically unmatched. They might double him because they go, man, Sean Payton draws up nine plays for him that we can't stop every week, so right. let's double him on third and eight. But it's not because he's beating people. One guy that you did like his athleticism, uh, Aaron Donald, you wrote, Donald's power, holy shit. Holy no shit. No one has stood ground versus Pete all season. Yes. I just, that's what was amazing to me. I mean, he, you know, it, it made me think of Todd Gurley when he came on the podcast a few weeks ago. And he just said he's a freak. Like, we see him, you know, 600 pounds in the weight room and doing stuff like that. And it showed in this game. Because I felt like the Rams, who got run on against the Vikings the previous week, they knew, okay, shit, it's the Saints coming. This and all lines real. Run on us and too. they didn't get over aggressive in the run game. They played a little bit more like, no, we're going to stand our ground in this gap and yes. not get out of position. And I haven't seen anybody really stand up to Pete consistently all year. And Pete a few times gave him the old, like, what? You're not moving. Okay, we're going to sit here and stalemate. Yeah. Right. Well, it's funny. There's a line on the recent Jay Z album where he says, a loss isn't a loss, it's a lesson. And I think what separates really good teams in the NFL is when you get your ass kicked by a team like the Vikings. Maybe that's what the Rams needed to play a more disciplined run front. I, yes. They came in 28th against the run. Right. Maybe you need to get your ass kicked in the middle of the year by another team that's you're competing with. That's what matchup football will do sometimes because it'll, it'll, it'll show you your flaws. Gruden used to say when we would play a team that he thought was doing something not sound, yes. he'd go, <laughs> I think we owe it to them to show them they can't play this defense against this formation. We owe it to them as coaches in the NFL to show them this is ridiculous. How many times would it work? Usually, like when he had some, like when he would say something like that, he was pr pretty on it. And then like, would we that pump up it. the team? Because uh, he'd come in, he'd be like, <laughs> "Well, yeah, you would just know like, when oh, he had that shit. look, right? You were like, oh, he found a formation or something that he likes in the he got in the science lab, and he's gonna fuck it up." That's gotta put a little cock in your walk too, when it you does. know that you have a coach that can find stuff. No doubt. Yes, that's what a great offensive coordinator does. I mean, I've seen that with Sean McVay, whoever it is, they yeah, instill giants. confidence in your team. Right? <laughs> <laughs> fucking mac <and> dick. <laughs> uh, we gotta make sure we're gonna do Gabe before. Yeah, so that, I'm right? thinking I'm gonna bring Gabe on in five minutes. Okay. We have a he's our so camera operator Gabe. Over there. He's nervous, but he's we've been with him forever, and he's a, and he's a huge fan. Giants fan. Right. Uh, Panthers Jets. Damn, Cam missed a lot of throws. Yes, Cam got not one of his better games. No, not one of his better games. Cam got into his early season. You know, I just I call it like herky jerk, or me and my father would call it the old steroid jerk. You know, from what what's that uh, one of the baseball movies? But regardless, yes, it was just a very he was just doing it all arm, all upper body, yes, not it, setting his not feet. setting his feet, or his legs were totally out of whack, and he was just trying to do it that way, and he missed too many easy completions. Uh, you also wrote Jonathan Stewart does something every game to fuck this up. Can we just get another running back? They yeah. grow on trees, right? But then the one I really found interesting is you wrote Panthers defense. Yeah, if you can protect. You can get people open. Yes. They cannot play man-to-man. -man. No. So that is the weakness of this great Panthers defense. I think we're seeing that. I mean, it's just between this game a little bit, you think about the Patriots, you think about the New Orleans Saints, the defense is still really good. But unlike a Minnesota, okay, or a Jacksonville, uh, th those are teams where I look at and they can go, all right, we play zone a lot, but when we have to, we can man you up and stop you on third and four, and that's what worries me about the Carolina Panthers. Patriots-Dolphins. I remember watching the game on Sunday, and they showed me an entire video package of Tom Brady oh. getting hit to the ground, oh. and you wrote, stop talk of Brady getting hit. He has amazing pass pro. Phenomenal. It, I, I'm not like trying to be a jerk here. Okay. This is not I, because I know everybody's probably going to go, oh, this is, you know, so mean of you to say. Okay. So, first of all, they're, they've been sacked the 21st most times in football, right? So, so, bottom third. Bottom third. All right. So, he's, and then uh, I know he's amazing and he's amazing in the pocket. They call right now plays down the field to throw the football. And when that happens, you're going to get hit sometimes. And when you want to hit Brandon Cook's 25-yard right. crosser and you know he's going to get open, you, need you hold the develop. pocket. right? Yeah. So the protection was phenomenal. Phenom like 
out of this world the you number. You compared the interior offensive line of the Patriots to that of the Broncos during the Elway days. Yes, they were they're they're an extremely impressive athletic power combination where they're not these giant mammoth guys. They're like six two, six three. Shanahan guys. But yeah, but just built the right way and not only can just beat you in power blocking, but if they have to do something athletic, they can do that as well. Like the Dolphins did a great job covering a lot of the Patriots concepts down the field. I really was. It was totally. That's why I love watching film. Because, you know, on TV, I kept going, you saw the three big pass plays where guys were wide open. wide open. Right. But then I watched the film and I was like, damn, those were really like the only plays where guys were open the whole game. Everything else was Brady making a great throw or he had great pass protection and the corners couldn't protect any longer. I know he's the unicorn and everyone goes, oh, he's getting hit. This is crazy. But like other great quarterbacks are getting hit way more than him. Tell Tom to go talk to Matt Stafford and see how he feels. (sighs) Uh, Two guys on the Dolphins you're not impressed with right now. Sue. Not special anymore. Mm. He might need to take a pay cut or move to a different team. And the other guy was Landry can't run away from anybody. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not. All right, so just my two examples. And I know you kind of think I'm a Jarvis Landry hater. Uh, and I don't I, and think you're a Jarvis Landry hater. Yeah. But he's in the Michael Thomas where he's a good r- wide receiver, but he's not a number one in your book because he can't beat anybody. He can't do it by himself, right? right? That's a number one to me. Like, we don't – fuck the play design. It doesn't really matter where we line him up. When he gets covered man-to-man, you're going to lose. That's a, that's the number one to me. That's Antonio Brown or Julio Jones or A.J. Green. Um, all right, first of all, the suit thing. I, I, I should really look it up, and if anybody's back there listening, maybe they can look it up. But, this, like, I don't know what his contract details are. Right, I can look but, it up. But I'm sure he has a huge number. If it's not crazy to where it would be dead salary next year, yes, I think that, uh, you know, he's just no longer in the conversation for one of the five best defensive tackles in football. I'm sorry. He's just no longer in the – What has fallen off? Well, I just think it's years of wear and tear. He just doesn't dominate people man-to-man the way he used to, you know – He's um, not in the class of a Fletcher Cox or a Keem Hicks or an Aaron Donald. They are clearly a level or two above him. He's still a good defensive tackle. Don't get me wrong. But he's not like the Indomitian Sioux we saw back in the day. He still has two years left on his deal, 2018 and 2019, and he has a potential out year in 2020. If you cut him next year, it's $22 million in dead cap, so that's not happening. And then 2019, it's $13 million. So it sounds like you have at least two more seasons of Indomitian Sioux. Let's bring in Gabe. We'll get to the rest of the team. So, Gabe, come on over here. Don't be nervous. Uh, The New York Giants. Ben McAdoo took the podium and said, we are going with Geno Smith. Leave your headset on. I want you to look the part so they know what you look like. We are going with Geno Smith because he gives us the best chance to win and to give us the New York – I'm going to let him use mine. To give us the New York Giants perspective, you have to stand up. Because I really don't know. I have not paid attention to what the fans of New York are saying. You've been emailed and texted a million times. I had to ask to come on and give my take, but I don't know what everybody's take is. what is the vibe of the Giants fans right now? Come over here. So I think this goes two ways. What's up, everybody? Uh, I think this goes two ways. You have half of the side that is looking at how dare you do this to Eli. He's done so much for the city. He holds so much weight in sports history in New York. He's won two Super Bowls, whatever, 214, 210 consecutive games. Right. The other side, which this is where I'm kind of torn in between, is you knew you needed a new quarterback, at least at the end of the year, if not next season. Right. So my whole thing is after Odell went down in San Diego – you knew the season was a wrap. It's right. done. You're not catching up to Philly. Dallas at that point was still uh, – so, <laughs> so there we go. Los Angeles got <laughs> charges. Um, and it's just – at that point, like, if you knew you weren't going to play Eli anymore – and I completely get where Eli's coming from, where Eli said, look, if I'm not going to play the whole game, then why play it all? Let the right. other guys play. Yeah, but right. Giants, fans, Giants fans aren't as reasoned as Gabe. Like, people are more upset than yeah. this. You're – like, what are what are Giants fans Tell me, like, yeah. What, right? I'll tell you this right now. Right. When I saw – when I got the update – Team Stream app. I'll right. plug that. When yeah. I got the update, I texted uh, my boss Steve immediately, and I said, "They're benching Eli. There is a God." And the reason is, we have five games left, and this is probably the first, hopefully, and not in the future time that we'll have a top three pick. You got to see what Webb has. I think the issue is because everybody in the New York area, at least, that has watched Geno Smith right. implode and, and and you know go through all the ups and downs of the Jets, it's how dare you knock off Eli for Geno. I think if it was a transition from Eli – 
to Webb, it would have been, all right, it's the young guy. We got to see what he has. Then we can make a decision whether or not. Because if Webb comes in and pulls, like, I'm not saying he will, but like a Tom Brady or something, right? then go get one of these tackles. Go get one of these interior linemen in the draft. Go so, get a Quentin yeah. Nelson. But, so, okay, so, yeah. so, but the, long story short, the, 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 you think. It's because it's Geno. Well, okay, so, so it's Geno, but the fans right now are just, they're, do they feel like they, fans the right Giants now, disrespected Eli yes. with this? Absolutely. I mean, Francesa went on a rant last night. Right. Giants fans are saying, how dare you treat him like this? How dare you do this? Like, blah, 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 blah. The, what, what he's saying is this. I believe that mm -hmm. the reason Giants fans are upset, there is a sandwich. There is a coach, and then the middle is the decision, and then the other bun is the quarterback you're going to. And right, right now, the cutting of Eli is from Ben McAdoo to Geno Smith. If Tom Coughlin benched Eli for Davis Webb, they'd go, we get it because they're moving on. But the fact that Ben McAdoo is giving it to Geno Smith, it's they're taking it like the biggest okay. smack in the face All right. ever. All right, so this is where we have to set the record straight. Way to go, man. Gabe. You're yeah. the man. You're the man. Gabe Gomez, St. Peter's Prep's <laughs> finest, <laughs> New Jersey City, going to lose to Bergen Catholic this week. Uh, but – um, all right, so this is where people are wrong. They're so angry. This is where they're wrong. Because they of all. feel like they're not the classy New York team anymore. They think Gosh, they out This is the, the classiest Jets. benching I've ever seen in my life. That's what's crazy. This, Talk I've about never seen it. a classier benching. I've never. Like, never. And Ben McAdoo has absolutely zero to do with this decision. Zero. Like, there's no way Ben McAdoo has the authority to make this call without the Mara's consent and the Tish's consent. A few weeks ago... He, when they asked McAdoo after one of the games, and I don't remember which one was, you know, when they said, is everybody, you know, competing for the job? And he's, you know, he came in and, and, uh, and they said, what about Eli? And he goes, everybody's competing for their job. We're going to evaluate everybody tomorrow. Then the next day he came out and clarified, not everybody. Eli's fine. His job's fine. Because he was told by the owners, you're not allowed to bench Eli. Yeah. So shut up, Ben. Okay. So that's where that one went, went from there. They're benching a guy. Again, greatest quarterback of all time. That's not For playing the Giants. Not playing very good football. For the last two years. And they actually gave him the respect to say, you know, we're going to bench you, but we'll let you start and still play. Like, that's the, the nicest fucking thing I've ever heard. So I don't. You wouldn't be insulted by that? They're giving him the respect, like, to at least extend this. What's to be insulted by? I'm. That you're paraded out there just as like a memento. Well, oh, okay. Oh, but how long does this story go on? Again, this is where my problem with professional sports. This is not just about Eli, but it's what year fourteen. <laughs> it's coming to it. Like, well, we. It's again. It goes back to like my Peyton Manning thing. Like he's still the best. He's in a wheelchair. Nine. He's fifty-five years old. We can still win the Super Bowl with him if we got a great offense and the best receiver ever and the best yes. lineman ever and the best. Blah, 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 like. So I, I just don't understand what, what everybody's saying. I actually everybody's said angry this about. today. Yeah. I think that this is the best thing that ever happened to the Giants. Because I think that the other way, they were gonna have to do the Derek Jeter farewell tour and lose games with Eli and do the ceremonial thing, and maybe it goes into next season and they have to throw away that season because Eli wasn't gonna be good. But now you get to pin it on McAdoo. That's what it's going to look like. It's McAdoo's decision. So instead of going, oh, shit, Eli's under contract. We have to play him next year, and we don't want him to do this. Right. No, now they can go McAdoo's decision, and now they can get a clean break. I, I think what's interesting is Giants fans, in my mind, were like, they know McAdoo's going to get fired, but should McAdoo just sit there and allow his, like, tenure as coach just end he's desperate as fuck that dude wants to make a change I, again i don't think it has anything to do with him really? I, I think that this is a this is a team the new york football giants they are trying to be good at football and they're not very good and their quarterback is up there in age and they have to start going we're worried about our football business and yeah. need to start getting better at things the one thing i'll say with the whole mcadoo thing it, to me, this shows me, like, McAdoo should be concerned. Like, first of all, I don't think McAdoo, he might have won on a bench. Like I said, I don't think he can make that call without the Maris. Right. And uh, this is now, I, if I am McAdoo, I'm officially scared for my job because this shows Chris, you. Chris, you should have been scared for a month. Well, I know, but he probably, this would be the final move to go, oh, shit, they might really change everything around. Oh, he's fucking done. Uh, quote, uh, David Deal tweeted out today, I just took a break from the radio show to grab coffee, and I see two Giants players in the cafeteria. It was Eli Manning sitting next to Davis Webb mentoring him. 
Hashtag respect. <laughs> yeah, Elon's going to do it like a professional. Yeah. yeah. He is. Well, I think, you know, all the media people came out and they were like, Eli has been a class act. This is unprofessional. I think I heard your dad on the radio and we're going to have him on in like a minute. Was like, I wouldn't have played either. Like, I would have done the same no, thing as well. Yeah, definitely not. Um, I, I'm like you. I came in and was like, do people realize that Eli has sucked for the last two years? They just feel like they're doing him dirty. And to me, it's like... If you got fired from Bleacher Report right. from from a salesperson that you didn't respect, and they came up to you and said, "By the way, Chris, I'm just letting you know that that Bleacher Report's going to fire you." Right. They don't like the messenger. Nobody in New York respects Ben McAdoo. Yeah. They think he's a clown. Right. So the fact that he's the one ending Eli, they're going, "Who are you?" Gino is not as bad as everybody thinks, too. And that's the other problem: is you're taking a New York Jet cast off because Giants fans love to tell Jets fans they're a second-class citizen. Right. And the fact that it, the trivial pursuit question is going to be who replaced Eli Manning, Gino Smith. Yeah. They're going, "Oh, you guys took G now. They're replacing Eli right. with Gino." Right. Yeah. I mean. Listen, it's not going to look pretty because the Giants' offense sucks. I don't care if they get Tom Brady, maybe Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson can make it happen. But yeah, it's uh, it's just it's going to be a tough look. I just want to like Gino just to defend him a little because I've heard some of those criticisms. Gino played as a rookie and a second year player with absolutely no good football players around him. None. Gino has had like Eric the Decker worst wasn't career there. Arc Brandon ever. Marshall was not there. The offensive coordinator, everybody agreed, stunk at the time. All of those things that went against him, but that doesn't he got punched get in the about. face. Well, yeah, and he was in it. Uh oh. Does that mean his phone's not plugged in? Otherwise, please redial the number you are calling, starting with the area code. Call again. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, no, no, he'll be there. It's been fascinating to watch people get so upset with this Eli Manning stuff, and I knew that was going to be your take because we've sat here. It, the best game Eli's played in the last two years was the first half of the wild card playoff game. Right. Right. Other than that, he's been awful. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. You know who we should talk to about this? Let's get him on the case. A former quarterback. Blowhard 11. <laughs> Phil Sims. Here. Oh, hey there. Hey there, Phil. Oh, well, what do you know? It's the front runners. Yep, that's what, what we What does that mean? Well, you know, just call me when you want. You know, like last week, you take a week off. You know, I don't know. We're now, I was busy. told by me. Christopher. So, yeah, all right. I was told by Christopher that you were busy last week. What was last week? Thanks. Paul Starr died, and it was a weird week because of Thanksgiving. Okay, it was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we were just talking about Eli, and your son doesn't understand why people are upset. Wow. Well, I mean, I listen. Yeah, I don't. I. I, so I, I I've stayed him. away out of the public reaction. So I've literally am learning the public reaction. We're live on the show, and and I understand Eli. Like I've said many a times, greatest quarterback in Giants history. Sorry, Dad, you're number two. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that they call Will, I'm actually going to the lawyer tomorrow, so I'll remember these statements. But keep going, son. <laughs> okay. Uh, but. Um, yeah, I you know I guess I am a little surprised just by some of the reaction I've heard that people have just said he's been t you know somewhat disrespected in the way the Giants have handled this, and I I'd love to hear your two cents about yeah, that. Sims thinks it was handled very respectfully. I'm Chris. Well, Chris, yes, Christopher, we're both Sims. Christopher believes they handled it very respectfully. Well, listen, I was on the radio with the great Boomer Esiason this morning, and, yep. and then four hours. So that means oh. I talked for about a minute 30. <laughs> a minute 30. No, that's, that's terrible, isn't it? But that's what we do. We take shots at each other. And we got done, and somebody said, man, you know, this and that. And, you know, I always tell Adam, I always tell Christopher, I don't even realize that we're, I'm, like, saying derogatory things towards you, and we do it so much that it just it comes easy. But we talked about it. <clears throat> In situations like this, fans are very emotional. And it's been, what, 14 years for Eli Manning? And you, you can never take away, you, you know, when everybody looks back, they remember the great things. Right. They don't remember the losing. They don't remember an interception. They remember what? They remember two Super Bowls. Right. So that's it. <clears throat> you know, I don't cross a giant fan ever that goes, oh, wow, that playoff game in 1989 or whatever. All they talk about is the Super Bowls. That's it. Right. Because those are moments they remember that are embraced just like we do. I, I think all athletes remember when it's over uh, the, the good times. Fans triple that. And, you know, I, I live it. 
and, and I feel it from fans every single day of my life. And you know what they say? And he said, I was there at the Rose Bowl, my father. And, and um, you know, I think, and I even said this, you don't realize how um, emotional it is for the fans. And I hate to say this, but especially up in this area, yeah. because the giant culture is just like the Yankee culture. It's deep. It's old it's school. part of families yeah. and everything. And, um, you know, I, I, as time goes on, I've gotten a greater and greater sense of that. You know, when you play or if you're a commentator or whatever, it, it's, uh, it's hard to relate to that sometimes. So th- the people coming out today are not the people that have been calling the radio stations or doing whatever. The ones that are coming out today are the ones that remember everything that's good. Right. You know, during the week when the Giants lose, if they said, well, you know, they didn't block and Eli missed the pass and that they do those things. But, you know, so I definitely understand the the fans calling you this morning on the radio show with Boomer. Let's just say for a number, we took 25 calls. I would say 23 of them were positive. And the, the other two were not even negative. They just weren't, like, over the top. Right. So – all right. I think you've always got to understand that when you're talking about players and especially when you're talking about fans. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I, I think you make a good point there because I, I, we are we're a little too connected to the sport of football. I would feel that way with, like, the Yankees, who is a team I'm emotionally invested in. The the All right, the other thing I just – I'm interested to hear your side of this is just that there's no way in your eyes, or at least I said this before we called you, that they would even – that Ben McAdoo has the power to bench Eli Manning, right? I mean, in my estimation, or just from what I see and read, and it's the Maras and whatever, I would think that has to be cleared through the Maras and Mr. Tish, right, before Ben McAdoo can even make that dis- decision? Absolutely. I, I, I believe that's what he wanted. Uh, you know, th- this is just me and my belief. Right. Oh, I believe it's what he wanted. Um, he pushed it to throws it by, you know, I would think Jerry Reese, but then it's taken to the owners, right. no doubt. This decision cannot be made without the owner's consent, consent, and I think that's already come out, that the that they said, yes, okay, if that's what you're going to do, let's do it. Right. And uh, so it's got to be handled that way. Yes, when you're talking about, again, Eli Manning, two of the streak, the two Super Bowls, two Super Bowl MVPs. Right. That's not a call that they just give to a second-year coach. Saying, yeah, yeah, coach, whatever you want, whatever you think. Right. Um, yeah, because my thing was – Let me just say this, Mac- too. Say it. Tell me which way they were going to do this. Exactly, yeah. That it was not going to cause this kind of uproar. There's no way – everybody goes, well, they should have let him play the year out. They said, then what? If they decide to move somewhere else, we're going to have this outrage. So, and, and if they – Said, just play this game. We're going to play the other guys the last. Oh, they're, you, they're, you're disrespecting him. So there's really no easy way out of it for anybody. And um, that's why I think this is Manny perfect. Asked, Do you want to start the game to keep the streak going? Well, of course he doesn't. Yeah, right. He just said yes. It would have been against everything he has stood for for 14 years. Right. Yeah, I just right. think it's perfect because. The transition was going to be hard, but now Ben McAdoo gets to be the fall guy, a guy that fans already don't like, they've already moved on from, and now the franchise can can put it on Ben, and when he's gone, that's how Ben McAdoo will be remembered, the guy that sat Eli Manning, and it doesn't oh, fall back on the Maras or the Tishes. Here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's the I, truth. It is, it is rough. Listen, I do believe, you know, I think about these things all the time, and people say, oh, that team has nothing to play for. And, I, you know, I love that statement. What? What do you mean they have nothing to play for? Well, their midfield is fourth and ten. Just go for it. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah, that's what coaches do. My instinct is, oh, I don't care. We have nothing to lose. Let's go ahead and lose. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's – but what if it's, it's like you time. said, Bill Parcells said used to, it was gonna ha- Bill Parcells used to say, like uh, the record's going to be on his tombstone for every it's year. It's on his tombstone. Right. So Ben McAdoo is right. not giving up. So I believe, you know, and I said this with Boomer today, he's thinking of it. He, he thinks he can still save his job. And, he, okay, he looks at it and goes, maybe these other guys can give us a spark. I don't know. But uh, I don't think that he is sitting there going, I'm going to be fired and I'm going to do this. You know, just in spite or whatever, or whatever, however you want to put it, Adam. And Ben McAdoo is twelve and fourteen as a coach, and if he can somehow get to five hundred at the end of the year, it's not a bad tombstone. Yeah, that's right. So wait, sorry. So that's that's the other thing, Dad. Uh, uh, just uh, like 
the other thing I said right before we called you is I would I would think this kind of move would actually be scary for Ben McAdoo. Like, uh, to know, you know, I guess what I'm just trying to say, to know that the ownership is ready to move on from Eli a little bit might show that they're also willing to move on from you, Ben McAdoo. So I just would like to hear your two cents on that because I haven't talked to you about any of this. Well, yeah, listen. Would you be more scared if you're Ben McAdoo this to go is now? This compliments to the, the Bleach Report app. John Mara doesn't guarantee Ben McAdoo's job is safe for the season. Quote, I'm embarrassed. Nobody's doing a good job. Okay. So that, well, that just came it out. It kind of says it all. Right. But, you know, you go, you got to go down swinging and go down the way you want. And they're, they, they're desperate. You know, all the, the points, it, it, it's an indictment on everybody, the fact you know, I didn't even realize it. Since he's been, they have not scored over 30 points. You know, bad teams almost luck in the 30 point game here and there. Right. So, uh, you know, that's really tough. And the Washington Redskin game, uh, I, I think that's the one they finally said, okay, we're not going to have a rally here. The team is not going to turn around. Right. So they start making these moves. And right. that's, you know, that's the Washington Redskin game Ugh. on Thursday night. Ugh. So bad. Yeah. Ugh. And you, look, you, you guys, you know, and I'm like you, I will never turn a, tea, a football game off. Yeah. I, well, we were sitting next to each other, you and me, but yes, we. we yeah, but I right. wanted to keep watching. Right. And I watched it to the end because it was like watching. I was like, man, it's like a horror movie. Yeah. Right. I was I at my. Right. I was at my uncle's so bad house. So I had to wait to see what was going to happen. Yeah. I was at my uncle's house, and they said, Adam. This game sucks. You can go home. I said, yeah, but I just I want to keep watching. And then, like, every play, they'd look at me and go, you want to watch this shit? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, maybe something will happen. It was bad. All right. It, not- it, it was. And it, it just, you know, the, the difference was in, in the whole game is that the Washington Redskins, just their quarterback is still young, daring. Yeah. Uh, the offense is wide open. And, you know, Jake Gruden made some big mistakes in that game. Oh, wow. Man. And I actually watched it again, but whatever. And they just <laughs> whatever. They just seem to have a little more will to win and to get it done. And they just had more players and more thoughts on the offensive side. Right. Spon- finally beat the giant defense down where they made a few plays to win. Spontaneous yeah. question for the Sims men. In 2018, Eli Manning will be the quarterback for oh. blank. Wow. You want to go first, Dad? No, because I don't know. Listen, it's a fucking guess. I'm going to say the Jaguars. Of quarterbacks out there. I'm going to say nobody. Like, oh, I'm going to go pick a team and go. Chris Sim because says it's, nobody. It's, I say know, nobody. Going down the list, there are a lot of guys. Right. And Alex Smith is going to be out there. Alex Smith, you know, Tyrod Taylor. So who do you want? Alex Smith or Eli Manning? That's does he fit your offense? Case Keenum could be a free agent. Right. Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, I, I we had a list. There's like 12 guys out there that are. Got to be floating around. So Christopher Christopher says nobody. I think he's going to reassess and he'll retire after the year. I do. Do you really? I do. That's just my two cents. I mean, yeah. No, I'll say this. If the, if the right team. Right. If Jacksonville calls, maybe. He's going. Right. Because. They can win the Super Tommy Bowl. Tommy Cough. It, it's, it's, it's a position that who in this day and age, who would ever, like, Boomer says to me, why does Tom Brady keep playing? And I went, what are you, nuts? It's it's easier now than ever. He's mm. on the perfect team. He's got everything at his disposal. Right. The coordinator, 70% of the time he drops back, a little more than that really, The one when I count the numbers, yeah. he throws to the first receiver. Oh, Tom Brady doesn't have to go to his third and fourth receiver. I love hearing that on TV. That's his fourth guy. Yeah, right, okay. I played 15 years. There's that fourth guy once by accident. You know, that's, that's a big fallacy. But why would he leave? It is so perfect and everything. That's why. And never under the power, the money, it's who you are. Right. That's why you want to stay into those positions. And you know when it's over, it's really over. Right. And, and my guess- last little – I have many gripes. Yeah. But here's the other one I just go. I remember years ago, I can't remember what year Case Keenum came to the NFL, a coach destroying him, the team he was on. He stinks. He's awful. I don't even know why we have him on the team, and boom. Then he hangs in there, and I think the St. Louis Rams pick him up. They move out to L.A. He plays with a really horrific offense last year and actually does a pretty good job if you're really watching it and paying attention. Sure. But if you're just going by the numbers and they're losing and you go, 
oh, he's, you know, and now look where he is. Right. Look what happens. But my point being, oh, well, the quarterback, it's, it's all about your winning. You know, the quarterback's just got to win. And I, I hate that statement, too, because it's a little more than that, isn't it? That, that we count on a little more than just a quarterback? That, oh, well, they just got to get a quarterback. Oh, yeah, that'll solve every problem right there. Just get the guy. And no matter who you to put in L.A. last year, Tom Brady, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, right. I don't care. They were going to lose. Right. So it, it, that, uh, that it, it just always bugs me. The quarterback's job is to win the game, and that's how I'm going to judge him. Yeah. Okay, coach, that's great. Yeah, that well, was... Get me some players and draw up better plays and call them in a better order to give us a chance to maybe win. That's right. I, I, I hear you. I, Tell I, us how you really you're, feel. You're done now. You're cut off. You've been on here for 16 minutes. We're going to hang up on you. Phil, I, I want to let that you know. That was 16 minutes, and it, it flew by. It felt like 30. Yeah. It, was, it was great. <laughs> Phil, I want to say this before you go. We get a lot of comments, whether it's on Instagram or the iTunes page, and lately there has been one message in all of them. I love hearing Phil raw. I never knew he was like this. It's my favorite part of the show. I want you to know that we appreciate having you on, and the fans love it, and they just want to say thank you, dude. You're kicking ass. Well, that's beautiful. You know, if you really appreciate me, you know what you can do, right? Catch Catch your ass. Send me a check, oh, brother. There you go. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to HR. <laughs> okay, I'll wait for that check. I'm sure that's in the mail. All yeah. right, okay. make sure you keep right, me in your will. Too. We'll talk to you later. Try to be try to be a little above average if you possibly can. All right, I'm going for later. B+. Plus. We'll do our best. Uh, hangs up on yeah. us. When he gets going. Oh, you how get, was Thanksgiving? Did you get a word in? Well, he was he, he didn't get there to like 9 o'clock because he had to do the CBS right, right, post-game right. Right. show and all that stuff too. But, uh, no, that's the way he gets going. Anytime. It doesn't matter if it's just me and him. We could be in the weight room in Jersey. Yes. And if somebody just gets him going, Says somebody like finds Matt Stafford's overrated. Are the right thing, right? Then What's funny it. is, is he gets upset, and then he'll get upset about something, and as he's discussing it, it'll bring him up something else. Yeah, right. So right there, he's yes. talking about Eli, and then it brought him to something about Tom Brady, right. and then from Tom Brady, he went to Case Keenum. Right. Like there's like a word or something that just triggers it. And it's great. Yes. And then at the end, oh, it's just, he's the fucking man. Yeah. Well, awesome. uh, you know, well, listen, you can think of what you want of us as Sims, whatever. We're crazy. We might be stupid. We do love football. Love and we it. really think about it all the time. Yeah. So my, my thing is uh, with Eli, just to kind of wrap it all up, yeah. I think it's the messenger mm-hmm. is the reason people are so upset. There, yeah, yeah. I think if you might Coughlin be right. delivered this, they'd right. say the general has spoken. Right. But because it's McAdoo, Fat Riley, they go, <laughs> Like, like what Francesa said in his rant. Right. Who the hell are you? My friends to love sit. that you call him Fat Riley. They think I want to give like, credit to Nikki G. Our, our, he's doing our audio engineer right now. Right. Who came up with that first? Oh, he did. Okay. But it's it's genius. It is genius. It really is. Fat Riley. Fat Riley. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is funny that Ben McAdoo could finish 500. Yeah, I know. Man. Right. Uh, all right, let's get to the rest of your game breakdown, and then we have to do MVP and stuff, and then iTunes. I'm keeping it tight today. Uh, Chiefs, Bills, I'm sorry. Alex Smith is horrible in the pocket. Maybe the Chiefs should become a power running team. And t- and Tyrod is a better version of Alex Smith, but he's still not great. Right. I it it was watching the game, and I go, I'm watching the same guy, except Tyrod just better than Alex Smith at yeah. doing it. Like. Too conservative, people open, reluctant to, to pull the trigger, look at the rush just a hair too much. But Tyrod's faster and he's got a little stronger arm, and he's willing every now and then because he has a really – he's a talented thrower. Sure as hell. I mean, yeah, he really is. And he can make three or four throws every game where you go, wow. Yes, Alex Smith, plain and simple, did not play well. I you mean, really th- think they could become a power running team? I don't know if they can. to running the ball. Well, they have to think of something else to change is what my point was with that comment. Like, they got to change their their DNA structure, literally, because they're just – it's it's not going to work what they're doing. Teams have figured out, like we've been saying all along, you just take away some of the trick plays. We don't think you can beat us, Alex Smith, just being – dissecting us in the pass game. It's every year. And the decision-making wasn't good. The throws weren't good. And at times – where we talk like Brady. I mean, here he is at 40, <laughs> just fearless in the pocket, sliding and making little moves, buying time to look down the field and throw. And Alex Smith, as soon as he moves in the pocket, he just looks to run and he looks who's around him and he doesn't look down the field. All right. Jaguars, Cardinals. Oh, I knew you are going to like these ones. Bortles. What the fuck? 
The whole offensive game plan is to hide him, and it's embarrassing. Yeah, I can't take it. David Cole, I've never seen you write a GM's name (laughs) in a film breakdown. David Caldwell's ego is more important than the team. Painful, fucking joke, triple underlined. Really, though, really, they should run Bortles 15 to 20 times a game, treat him like a wildcat running back, let him get beat up. Who cares? He has to contribute something. Poor Leonard Fournette. Uh, Leonard Fournette's going to have a four-year career. I mean, he really is. It's it's just, I mean, nobody respects the pass game. Like we've been saying, Bortles was just absolutely pitiful. I don't know what else to say. He is by far the worst quarterback in football. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking in backups into that. I'm really not – like I get very emotional about this because I like to root for talented teams. Yes. Jacksonville is the best team in the NFL, like the best. But, again, he is the 70th best quarterback or however many quarterbacks there are in football. Right. He is towards the bottom two or three. I don't know. You know, Some teams have three. Some teams have two. But – the, the offense is literally designed to not let him mess it up, okay? Um, it's screens. It's boots. Boots. It's anything to where he doesn't have to make a play or a throw. His yeah, you, best, wrote, you wrote screen, boot, screen, boot. That's all it is, the whole game plan. The, the best thing he does is run. They need to go just Cam Newton on him. Mm. Just forget trying to throw it. Let's run the Wildcat. Have design runs. Let him run downhill. Third and one. Don't be afraid to just smash Bortles in the middle. I don't care. Who cares? It's not going to hurt his throwing. That's not good to begin with. I really think it's their best route. And then occasionally you'll get so many people go, damn, this Wildcat with Bortles and he's running. You might get some looks to where he can just lob up something one-on-one downfield, whatever it may be. It's so fucking frustrating. I'm telling you, if it ends up being Jaguars-Ravens in the first round of the playoffs, which there is a possibility, it will be like a Big Ten football game. Oh, my God. Run, 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 punt. Run, run. I mean, the Ravens are one of the worst teams to watch. I've already said this. Jaguars offense is right there. Was there anything else you liked in there? Because I wrote a lot of good stuff with that one. First of all, Doug Marone, like, calling the play to sprint out. You lost the game with that. Why would you trust him? He got greedy. Why would you trust him? He tried to fucking throw seven interceptions before that. And, gosh, damn, is Jacksonville's defense so good. Holy shit. Jacksonville got hosed in the game. There was some horrible calls. I even wrote it down. Line judge number eight was horrible. I mean, he was absolutely pitiful. He was one of those guys where I looked at the game and go, wow, Jacksonville's too big and fast and aggressive for him, and he can't figure it out, so he thinks they have to be committing penalties. Because that's how fucking good they are. That's how good they are. They called a pass interference once on a third and 17 that bailed Arizona out. Yes. And it was offensive pass interference. (sighs) He threw Telvin Smith to the ground, but there was so nobody open, even though he did that, and Blaine Gabbert was in trouble. He turned back to look at Blaine Gabbert running, and he saw – uh, Telvin, Telvin Smith, Smith and the running back kind of kind of tripping as they were going down, and he just threw the flag and called on Telvin. So Telvin Smith was standing there the whole time, I and mean, he did nothing. Um, their defense is one of the best defenses I've ever seen in my life. The Arizona Cardinals needed seven miracles to win that game, and all seven of them happened. It was unreal. I've Blaine never Gabbert deep balls, I mean, the intercepted by Tyron Matthew. Coverage, balls tipped in the air, interceptions dropped. I mean, anything you can think of that happened against Jacksonville, it happened, and they lost. And I feel bad for them. Uh, We cannot put the Jacksonville defense in our MVP board. We also had to take last week off, but the current standings, Brady with 19 points, Wentz with 14, Rodgers is still in third with seven, Uh, Russell Wilson's down there with two. Uh, Who is number three? Wilson. Who is number two? Brady. And number one? Wentz. I'm still going Wentz. It's close. Wilson is... You also, said this earlier. We were talking to Isaac Bruce, yeah. and we were talking about how non-quarterbacks, and yeah. you said this might actually be the year where a quarterback is actually deserving. Like, of it. totally deserving. Yeah, I, I do think it. Because, yeah, we had had years where, like, you know, hey, J.J. Watt got screwed out of winning it by himself, and there's been plenty of years in history. Uh, you know, AP had a share at one year, right, with Peyton, I believe. So, uh, yeah, we're in the time and era where, you know, the Heisman is no longer the Heisman. It's who's the best quarterback on the best team in college. Yes. That's the award. And, you know, the MVP, it's whoever's winning and putting up the best numbers. Matt Ryan. I mean, come on. Matt who's, Ryan's one of the least fourth? talented MVP ever. Um, 
If you're going to go okay. Wentz, Brady, yeah. Wilson, who's fourth? That's a good question. Mike Freeman in his article today said Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown is – he he did cross my mind right there when you said it. He, what he is doing is – it is truly phenomenal. I'm trying to think if there's anybody on defense we're missing. <sighs> Calais Campbell? Yeah, I mean, they're in the conversation. But that's the problem is it's not, so many guys. They're not wrecking the games like we've Everson seen other guys. Griffin? I know, like awesome Jadavian again. Jadavian Clowney is still fucking he's killing still people. amazing, right? Love him. I mean, he's amazing. I was so glad Gruden gave him a, the deserved respect. I was so really happy props. to see that. Um, you know, even like running back this year, there's no standout guy to where you just go, oh, wow. Seahawks got his podcast, asked me if Bobby Wagner is defensive MVP. He's up there. I mean, he's been really good this year. He's been the best player on their defense. Right. Yes. Uh, but no, he's not. I mean, nobody is better than Fletcher Cox. Nobody. He's your guy. Fletcher Cox is the best defensive player in the NFL right now. It's awesome. Plain, hands down. Uh, celebration rankings. Individual is still Golden Tate's people elbow. Team is the Steelers bench press. We are going to start off with individual. First one is Pac-Man Jones fake giving birth to the ball because he recently had a baby. Now, this was called that, back. Right. But in the celebration rankings, it still counts on the ground, and it's he's going to – Pretty good. Uh, Pretty good. I mean, Pop his, it out. his baby boy was born that morning. Which is pretty awesome. It is. And then uh, his teammate, Kirkpatrick, carried around the baby like it was Simba. Uh, <laughs> interesting. There's a lot of births happening right now. Uh, next individual one, this is Robbie Anderson. And this is going to something you liked earlier. He scores. He's going to lay down, and he's going to chill and sleep on the ball. I do like we that. We know how much you love the Kareem Hunt. Right. Sims loves sleeping on I like footballs. The, I like Kareem Hunt that he cradled up in, like, the spoon position, though. That was even better. Are you a big spoon or a small spoon? Spoon. I'm a big spin. Okay. Julio Jones went fencing hmm. with Hardy. So take it one more time. He scores, and they're going to go out there, and they're going to they're gonna take out their foils. And, and he uh, stabs them. And he stabs them fencing. Pretty active. Yes. Uh, next individual, Jonathan Stewart, who you believe should not be one of the featured running backs for the Carolina Panthers. He scores, and then he's going to line at the putt. He's going to hit it, and nailed it. And that shrunken Calvin Benjamin hanging out with him. <laughs> I, I didn't know who he was, but he just looked like a smaller version of Calvin <laughs> Benjamin. Last individual, Delaney Walker is going to score a touchdown. He's going to bring the ball over, and he's going to give full CPR. He's going to check for a breath, and then he's going to check for a breath, and it's it's alive. I don't like any of them. I think guys are losing their creativity. But I would out of those ones right there, I'm going Pac-Man Jones. Is it better than the Golden Tate's people elbow? No, it's not. And the Golden Tate's people elbow is still the still. individual. Yeah. Still the people's champ. All right, now team. We are still Steelers bench press, yep. which was Le'Veon Bell on Juju Smith-Schuster's back with the ball. Yep. We have a number of teams right here. We're going to start off first with Case Keenum scoring on Thanksgiving. He gets in the end zone, and I thought this was just egregious. The entire team gets in a circle, and they do Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, I, if I was a Lions, I would be so mad. They go out there. They're all sitting there. They're sharing plates, and then Stefan Diggs is in the middle with the turkey. Okay. Yes. That, I, if, oh, my God. Yes. Next one, Eagles. Alshon Jeffrey scores a touchdown, and then he is bowling for his ten teammates, and they ball, and all the pins fall down. And I did Alshon like Jeffrey it. gets a strike. I like that one too. Yep. And then the last one, and this is the famous one that was going around: the Eagles as a team doing the, the electric, electric slide, slide after they get a defensive turnover, and they did it multiple times because one time it ended up not counting, and then they go and they do the electric slide one more time after a Corey. Grant interception what is your pick that for wins that the electric, electric slide. slide yes what about it did you like i i love team stuff i love that it's like hey it's it's cheesy as crap but this is the one thing i'm looking for this is what i like it's cheesy because it's you know like an 80s dance and it's a bunch of big strong scary men doing it together which is mm. even better okay so the electric slide is your winner yes I, I, the electric slide has a chance to really be the champ when all sudden done because you guys have a thing right now where you're gonna you can start pissing people off. They right? are. I have to imagine. They so are. Th if they can start keep the turnovers going and they do it on the field in Seattle, I, th that's gonna piss us because off. Because what I like that's is what I want. All the other defensive teams when they get a turnover, they are all now doing the thing where oh, they I pose hate it. together I hate and that. they take a photo. Come on, can we think of anything better? But than the electric that? slide, people. Are I be could like, see the whole team doing it. 
Does the electric slide beat the Steelers bench press? No, but it's close. Motherfucker. Sorry. Sorry. You don't own that part of Pennsylvania. Why do you like the bench press so much? I don't know. It was just unique. It was still, you know, team oriented. Uh, and the way they thought it out, somebody kneeling down on their knees, uh, you know, who was that, Juju that got underneath yeah. him? Juju I saw in person, too. Man, he is. He's a big boy. And he's pigeon toed. Uh, is like, he pigeon Oh, my gosh, pigeon toed. So he, when people are left, walking around his you, left, you look? His left leg was so far <laughs> in, I wanted to be like, damn, you you got wings back there? <laughs> um, I, he is impressive looking, though. Who did we talk to about a possible celebration in New England? Oh, oh it was Juju. Should I say it here? Or should I wait until for it to happen? What, oh, well, he kind of told people at Beach Report what he's going to do if he scores in New England. Do I say it nah, now? Nah, don't blow it. Well, if he didn't say it on air, don't, don't blow it up it, yet. Save it. Wait, okay. Yeah. We'll save it. All we'll right. save it. Just know that it's coming. I'm proud of you, though. Why? Because I usually just say shit. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I have a, yeah, seriously. If you have a secret, don't fucking tell me. Because Chris will be like, hey, don't tell anybody, but I'm going to be on Sunday Night Football. And like two minutes later, people are going, hey, congrats on Sunday Night Football. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get to some iTunes comments. Guys, are going to be honest. I haven't had a chance to go through the IG DMs. They overflowed. I wasn't ready. And I'm going to get through them soon. I just need to take a, like literally a day. I have like 120, and I it's just overwhelming, and I get really overwhelmed. Uh, let's get to some iTunes comments. First one up, the goats from Kaw- Kawika. Damn it, he did, he wrote before Kawika Burrow. Favorite podcast? It's not even close. I literally look forward to Tuesdays and Thursdays because I know there's gonna be a new pod at Football Analysis, coupled with the feeling of hanging out with the guys. Big Phil is an OG. Josh is like the math nerd that takes stats for the high school girls basketball team. <laughs> Sims and Lefko are the best. <laughs> Keep fighting the good fight, y'all, and hook 'em horns. Hook 'em horns. Uh, next one, Seth Rice, 32. I've been listening to the show since the summer. By far my favorite football pod. My father-in-law is a former NFL defensive player of, of the year. Who? And listening to Sims is like talking to him. I swear all former players think alike. He's all about size and speed, but instead of legs and ass, he says, hi, booty. <laughs> Wait, who's this guy's name again? Uh, Said the name Seth again. Seth Rice. Seth Rice. I mean, it's not – Simeon didn't win defensive player I don't know. there. Lefko, Seth Rice, I want to know who your father is. Me too. Let us know. Lefko, father-in-law. Lefko father-in-law. comes up with some crazy oh, analytics, but most sorry. of it really makes sense. Love the podcast. You are the best. No, you are the best. Uh, needs ROA, a very funny show. A.J. Bouye's last name is pronounced Bouye. 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 Just ask him. Okay, I'll call him up. Other than that, I'm glad I stumbled across the show. It's been a staple of my workday. It's like listening to friends banter around sports at the bar. A lot of fun to listen to. All right, we do have a Jacksonville question off of that. The real Rael, oh no Jags. Sims, if Jacksonville would have taken Carr or another quarterback in that 14 draft, do you think they would be favorites to win it all by a long shot? And why would you take Bortles at three? Was he that good coming out of UCF? He's garbage in every sense of the world. Thanks, guys. Keep killing it. Yes. When he came out at number three, yep, Sims him. gave it an F right. and said it was the worst first-round pick that he's ever seen. Yeah. Other first-round picks in that draft, other draft picks, Johnny Manziel, right. would they be better off with Johnny Manziel? Well, yeah. No. I mean, I mean, they would be if we're saying he didn't do all the stuff off the field. Yeah. But Teddy yes. Bridgewater. Yes. Uh, who else was in that? That draft? was the three. Well, first Derek rounder. Carr. Derek Carr said. was the second. If rounder. Derek Carr was a Jacksonville Jaguar, I mean, they they would it would be them. We would I would pencil them in versus New England in the AFC Championship game right now. I would pencil it in, without a doubt. I'm not going to give anybody just that you're going to walk over to New England, okay? But this, like I've said, this is one of the. I'm not trying to like make, like this is one of the greatest defenses I have ever seen. I'm just saying that it's one of the greatest ever. I hate betting on Jacksonville because I root for their defense to come on the field because I think they have a better chance of scoring when their defense comes on than their offense. They they do. Let's stay in the state of Florida talking about quarterbacks is from John Johnson. Jameis Winston, Winston gets torched a lot for not taking the Bucks to the playoffs in his first three years. Mm. I'm an FSU fan and a Bucks fan. Right. Has he, cha- he has changed his throwing motion since coming into the NFL and doesn't look comfortable since getting into the league. 
What do you think Jameis could do if the Bucks find offensive linemen and teams start respecting the run game? His first two seasons, he had Evans and Vincent Jackson going down early to midseason with knee injuries and pulling wide receivers off the street. I just feel like fans and people should give him a chance with a running game and wide receivers that aren't afraid to be hit. I totally agree. I mean, I'm not going to say about the wide receivers afraid to be hit thing, but uh, if you read my notes from the the Falcons Bucks, I mean, the Bucks are not a good team, plain and simple. They're bad. Yeah, they're not they're not they're not I don't look at them and go oh wow this is really well coached uh and I don't look at I look at them and go damn your players aren't that good so yes everybody that's hating out there they on just lost Winston, two offensive linemen to yeah the they need to pump the brakes on this whole thing this is it's not easy I don't care who you put at quarterback for the Bucks they would struggle big time so Jameis Winston I still am a believer in him is he perfect no he needs to fix himself a little off the field with some of the carelessness of which he speaks but also um he also needs to clean up his mistakes in uh, on the field as well as far as just being a little careless with the football but I still think there is greatness to be had with Jameis Winston I'm not falling off that that bandwagon quite yet let's stay with quarterbacks Andrew Corpin awesome show you guys are the best honestly no other show or pod gives real in-depth analysis like you two awesome thanks Andrew thank you Andrew could Sims take the time to do a full Philip Rivers breakdown you could get back to this in a couple weeks if needed. I just really want to know what Sims thinks about his arm at this stage of his career and all that stuff. Thanks. Right. Uh, I, I could give it to you for sure. I mean, he, Phillip Rivers is still capable of winning a Super Bowl at the quarterback position. Is he as good as he was six or seven years ago? No. Did he ever have a great arm? No, he did not. I mean, he's he's a outlier as far as great quarter, quarterbacks in the history of football, right? He is not really a thrower, what you would call. Most of us as who played quarterbacks would say he's a little bit more of a pusher. Yeah, for That's sure. That's what he does, and it's interesting to see, hear the story. You know why he pushes the ball? No. Because when he was a little kid, his dad was a high school coach, but he still wanted to throw the high school football. So his only way to do it was kind of the shot it was too it. big? It was too big. So he kind of – that's how he learned how to do it. It's like he's throwing darts. That's what, It really is. There's no doubt. And it was at, at the start of his career, I was just like, man, I don't think he can do this. Like, can you be really good that way? Um, but still, fearlessness in the pocket – uh, ability to pull the trigger into tight windows or anticipate downfield throws is still through the roof. The only thing that's hurt Philip Rivers the last few years, in my eyes, is he's been careless with the football like you and I have talked about many times. I mean, where he was winning and carrying this team in the 11 and 12 and 13 seasons with this fourth quarter magic, I would say the last year and a half, he's probably lost more games than he's won with those scenarios, right? I mean, I, I, I don't have the statistic, but... You know, there were some late fourth quarter interceptions last year. Of course, there was some carelessness earlier this year. But uh, the way he's playing right now, and I think he's realized he's got a good defense. He's certainly taking care of the ball better. And they're dangerous. They are they're dangerous. fucking clicking. Yeah. All right, let's get to from one boy, white boy supreme to another. Uh, Dave Megzi, I like you guys. Oh, I like you too. <laughs> Hooked on a feeling, bird at Burl. He is a white boy supreme, I think, by Sims' standards, right? And then we have another one from D U D L Y. Best podcast I got. Fantastic show. Started playing the Sims plain and simple drinking game between the podcast and pro football talk, and I am plastered by <laughs> noon at work. <laughs> plain and simple. Damn, I gotta stop. That. Question Are Stefan Diggs and Adam Thiel in the conversation for best receiver duo yet? So, first, Adam. Adam Thielen, is he a white boy supreme? He is a white boy supreme. He might be the best white boy supreme in the league. Uh, right now, mm, yeah, I think he might be the leader in the clubhouse. I think you're right. He's, He's a number one. He is. And then so him Plain and Diggs. And simple, number one. Him and Diggs. Yes. Are they the best one-two in football right now? Um, just give me a second. Let me look at the teams. Okay. Okie dokie. Plain and simple. Is he better than Julio and Sanu? <sighs> As a as a tandem, yes, he is. Are they better than Antonio Brown and either Juju or Martavis? Ooh, that's a close one. Because you I'm, see the athleticism there. Yeah, I, I'm going to still say yes right now. It's close. Wow. Just because I, I'm not – Juju is really – I'm just not saying – I'm not going to put Juju quite there yet. Yes. He's had some great moments, and I really like the possibilities of him. Man, the Chargers with that, what they got Keenan out there. Keenan Allen and who's Man, the two? I don't know. That's the problem. That is, is it problem. Tyrell? Is it is – it, Benjamin, Travis Benjamin, Very, they don't really have a two. You're, you're right. It's it's who is it? Uh, it's okay. not Cooper and Crabtree right now. The Redskins. It's not Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas. No, it's definitely not. I, I mean, they. It's DeAndre Hopkins and Bruce Sellington. It's it, you're right. It's nobody there either. Honestly, AJ Green and Brandon LaFell. I mean, gosh. 
Are they the best? The Patriots. I'm just lo- thinking of them. Like, is it better? Are we going to count like Gronkowski and Cooks? He's a he's a tight end. Cooks and Hogan. I know, and Hogan Hogan hasn't really played. So you know, I think that's kind of answering the question. Michael Thomas. What about the Rams? Who are we going to give there to? Sammy Watkins and Robert Woods and Cooper Cup. I, yeah. That's like a three trio. That is Doug a trio. Baldwin and Paul Richardson. Ooh, that's a good one too. No, it's not though. But I think the Vikings won. I th- wow, they have the best duo. Or are you going to go Marvin Jones or Golden Tate? That's a good one. That's who I'm going to go with. No, I can't no believe disrespect. that's the best duo. If we're just going duo, because there is, there's some great trios. I think that's what we're starting to realize. After what I saw from Marvin Jones on Thanksgiving, holy shit. Marvin Jones and Tate have been on fire lately. So they I'm going to go with them as the number one t- duo. And then I'll go Thielen and Diggs. Well, I, I'll also say this. Jordy and Devontae Adams would have been good. If Aaron Rodgers was still around. Yeah, yeah. But you know, that sucks. If my you aunt know, had balls, she'd be my uncle. You know, we don't really see gender like that anymore. Well, since. I'm just telling you, if my Aunt Wendy had balls, she'd be <laughs> she'd be Uncle <laughs> Uncle Andy. <laughs> Why does her name have to change? I don't know. Wendy is you know. uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Football foot football noob. Homie podcast. The best podcast about football anywhere. It's like talking football with your homies. I've been listening to y'all for a while now, which has expanded my knowledge of the game. It's helped me love the sport even more. Y'all keep it up because everyone there at BR is killing it. Question, why don't more athletic players try to excel at playing on the O-line? There's obviously a lack of talent on the side of the line in college. Why not choose to excel at an O-line position where there's no competition? Seems like some O-line players in the league right now are leftover bodies they put out there. I I mean, I I think that's a, a fair statement and I think this is a conversation we've had on the podcast before I know my dad brought it up one time especially like some of these second team college defensive tackles like you know give up the dream it's not going to happen move over to the offensive line and be a center or a guard or a tackle I do think we're going to have to start seeing some of that and offensive line's money. not sexy it's not. right it's it is work as a unit you get no, really. The s- only stats they count are the ones that are were the negative. bad ones. At least as a D lineman, you get a sack or tackle for a loss, and everybody knows it. Nobody knows when you just collapse the left side of the defensive line and your running back runs for 40 yards. No one even gives a shit. They're and like, you oh. never get to celebrate. The only time you do is when a running back gives you the ball to spike. And honestly, I kind of find that depressing. Yeah, I hear you. It's like, here you go, man. This- so I think between that and the, the lack of, you know, legitimate like offensive line coaching in college yeah. football is, is led to a Well, lot I of would that. show them the contract that Kevin Zeitler and Andrew Whitworth signed this offseason. Yeah, it might change say, their – Hey. Right. Uh, this one is soccer because the other theme of our podcast is you disrespecting soccer fans. Sims. This, the, the title of this comment is Sims, the smart twin of Skip Bayless. That's awesome. Great job, guys. Keep it the great work. Sims, I know you're all on the idea of football players would be the best soccer players. I just – one thing that you consider – Unlike football, soccer is not about athleticism. Why aren't African players better than European or South American players on average? There are far more gifted athletically and Do also they really want to answer soccer. that question? Hold on. All right. By your logic, African players would dominate the sport. I'm not saying that Ronaldo or Messi would run over OBJ or Antonio Brown. I'm just saying they wouldn't have to. It's not that type of sport. Just consider Are that. You, they're not as quick or as fast. I, Odell Beckham Jr. would run by them and run around them. First of all, has there been an Argentinian or somebody from Portugal in the 100-meter final anytime in the recent history? Because I don't ever see them in it. I'm sorry. And then when it goes over to basketball, it's the same discussion, okay? And you got and there's lots Argentina of— Argentina was good for a little bit. I mean, okay, but I, I know. But I'm just still saying none of those players are we going, oh, they're the best players in the NBA because— you know my thought. The African-American athlete is the greatest athlete on the planet. I mean, just plain and simple. I don't know why we have to sugarcoat that. I mean, the greatest boxer in the history of this boxing. The, the reason the it's hard people, is we'll never know this answer. No. They're, we're never going to take great athletes and go, you're going to play soccer. Unless the, the football no, but, concussion. But what, people, what he's people. saying with the athletic thing, and again, I'm not diminishing. Like I know these are guys are phenomenal athletes. All I'm saying is you're missing the race of the greatest athlete on the planet in the sport. That's all I'm yeah. saying. He's Odell just saying it's Beck- not about athleticism. It's about touch and finesse and, and all that stuff. I, I guess. I don't I don't really. Well, I mean, okay, I, I think Odell Beckham Jr. could touch the ball with his foot. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to say that simple. 
Burton oh, for sorry. Life's comment is surprisingly great with eight. I don't know why this is surprising. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're not surprising. Oh, this is a good one. I always wondered who that weird looking blonde guy and kind of chubby, dark haired guy were that kept popping up in videos on my bleacher porn app. Finally, a slow off season, I decided to give this podcast a listen, and I've been thrilled ever since. These guys kill it with the in-depth football analysis and player breakdown. Then, just as things might get a little too serious, the awkward producer gets ranting on about Survivor. Bottom line, awesome podcast, great insight from a former player's perspective, a must-listen for anyone interested in the NFL. Quick question. Chicago is calling for John Fox's head now. Yeah. If he gets fired midseason, do you promote Fangio or Loggins mm. as the interim head coach? Right. I wouldn't – I mean, I wouldn't fire him at all at this point. But uh, if you do, I, I'm but, going Fangio. Yeah, I'm going Fangio He's as well. He's the elder states. No doubt about it. Been around a lot of winning franchises and a lot of other great coaches. If you had to promote either of them after this season if Fox got fired, would you rather have Fangio or Loggins? I would go Fangio still. I, I'm really a believer – and I think the Bears are close. I don't look at the Bears and go, ooh, the coaching's the problem. No. I go, the roster is the problem. They're just not a complete team yet. They've been rebuilding for the last two years. Yes. So they're not there yet. You know, missing out on Kevin White and what's happened has really hampered their football oh, team. Yeah. It really has. So I think that is where I look at it. So I don't think – I'm not necessarily going to sit here and go, John Fox should be fired. I don't, I'm not a believer of that. I understand if it happens. My big thing with the Bears would be don't let go of the two coordinators. That would be the big thing. I've been watching football my whole life. I like what they do schematically on both sides of the ball. They just don't have all the pieces to do make their Do you bring in a guy work. like John Fox, who's kind of the guy that doesn't work on either side of the ball, he's just the head coach, or do you get a guy that's a specialist to work with those guys? I, I, I think you could get a – yes. I mean, If a, both coaches came to you and said, I'm leaving if you hire somebody else, oh. would you make either of them the head coach? No, you can't let them run the organization. Gotcha. Okay. You can't. Last one, Chai Town Night. Love your show, Future Ideas. I was watching some highlights while I was cooking, and I had an idea about a topic. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to retro things that the NFL used to have in place, such as the umpire cam and other random things to keep the audience involved or bring them closer to the field? Would love to hear you guys talk about it anyway. Love you guys. You do an awesome job. Number one Bears fan. Well, I guess the, the new thing is they the, just tried to do the spider the cam. The spider cam, which was cool. I don't like it every play. I think you and I both agree. Like it was cool, but I didn't want to see it every time. I think we're so used to seeing football a certain way that to change that camera, I think that one of the best things we've seen lately is the pylon cam. I agree. I mean, those things are spot on on the sideline yep. or the goal line every time. I know that I would like to see a camera that is always on the goal line, right. all angles, to right. get rid of all the confusion. I'd like to figure out a way to get a sensor in the ball. I think you're right. To not rely on the referees and where Notice they place this a when first down. when you watch down. football. This is one thing I've noticed, and I'll, somebody brought this to my attention, so I'm not taking all the credit. But look how they spot the ball in the exact yard lines now more times than not to keep the game moving. That's one thing. And if somebody brought it to my attention, and I was like, holy shit, they're Not right. as many measures. It's not well, it, because they know, right, they don't have to measure, so they can keep the go-go. So if the guy's at the 33 and a half, they might just put it on the 34 when it's inconsequential just so they go, okay, I now we know that, the 44. I think is. it's fucked up when there's a game of inches and you have referees who are I moving get it. it by It's feet. not perfect. So, again, I, I think the game is actually – I think instant replay is being a little too much in my eyes I right think now. they need to do something about instant replay. Get, it's too much. But what about fun things? Are there any other camera angles or stuff that you'd like to see? Gosh, I mean, it would. I would love for somebody, to, if they can make it to where it didn't hinder the player, if you could put your – a camera inside a running back or a middle linebacker's helmet, and you got to see what they're seeing and the collision force and you which know, is going on. I don't on. know who does it, where they'll show you like from the quarterback's perspective. Oh, right. Sometimes it's just a lot, and I don't need it. Yeah. When they do the 360 camera and it's on like a wide open touchdown run, yeah. I don't really need all that yeah. stuff. You're just showing me what you're capable of. Yeah. Um, I think the only other thing that I would like would be cho like being able to choose cameras the entire time. As a fan, like I get to pick what camera I want. Hmm. I'd like a camera that's on the coach for the entire game. Right. I'd like cameras that are on the coordinators for the entire game. Right. I'd love to see coordinators getting excited or pissed. Right. Like when I see the season ending documentary and it's the coordinator, it's like, hell yeah, got that one. Like I love that shit. That yeah. shit's great. I hear you. Um, I'd like to know the discussion between New York and the referee when they're doing the reviews. I'd like to hear that conversation. I would too. Because if you're going to give us all the camera angles, why not hear what they're saying? Yes. Hey, I'm seeing this right here. Go completely transparent. Right. Anything else? 
No, but I think I'd like the AFC to give two of their playoff spots to the NFC. <laughs> Get 10 teams from the NFC, six teams from the AFC, or four teams from yeah, the AFC. Right. I don't know what I just said. Yeah, you, we got Eight from the NFC, four from the AFC. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything else that would be that would be in there. I my, also don't, my biggest thing for old school. If you just want me to go, why I want yeah. old school again? Just uh, I'm I'm sick of the concussion protocol. I'm sick of. I'm sick of just about every rule in football other than hitting a receiver defenseless in the head over the middle of the field. And I can understand the dead weight on the quarterback thing. That's the other one. Like, I mean, when a 315-pound man picks up a quarterback and this 315-pound man has got incredible body strength for anybody, let alone a 315-pound man, yeah. and then can just lift the quarterback easily and just drop all his weight, that I don't like. But from everything else, I want it done. I just want – I want like the UFC, the NFL to become the UFC. Change, <laughs> sign a waiver. I would, I would sign a waiver if I was playing the NFL right now. Like, if my bell gets rung, I'm a 37 year old grown ass man, and if I fucking want to stay in the game because my bell's rung, then fuck you, it's my head. I'm playing. Like that shit would drive me crazy. Like you've seen Russell Wilson yep. or I think Carson Wentz. I mean, it just, it's there's no way. I just don't understand it. It just it, never did I think Ray Lewis running to me full speed was healthy for me. At no point in my career did I go, hmm, Julius Peppers coming off the edge full speed and crushing me. Ah, <sighs> man, it's like vitamin C. That feels good. I will say this, and me and producer Josh, who's not here, were talking about this on the way to lunch yesterday. When there is a huge hit in the NFL, I used to go, oh, you got jacked up. And now I go, Ooh. shit. Yeah. He's gonna have problems later. Are they gonna make the field bigger? That's the that's another thing. What? I, what? Yeah. What? You can't change the dimensions of the field. Right. It's like the Hoosiers thing. It's a certain distance. The, the rim is always ten I feet know. tight. Guys, stick around. T.J. Watt. Uh, my quick interview with him is coming up next. We talked about James Harrison, what it's like being on the Steelers, and how focused they are. Speaking about helmet to helmet, he, he knocked Brett Hundley. On Sunday. Holy cow, yeah. That was a heck of a hit. There He's, was, yeah. Your was, man, Jay, your, uh, TJ was very impressive in person when I was watching from the sidelines. Oh, yeah. Yes, he really was. It's funny. Don't question him because his brothers, I also asked him about his brother. Say, hey, can I talk about your brother? And he goes, sure. I go, Derek, how's he doing? And he was like, oh, no one ever asked about Derek. <laughs> so that's coming up next. Uh, and then, of course, join us next episode will be our pick show, picking the games of the week for week, what are we in, 12? 13. 13. Oh, my God. Yeah. Week's 13, uh, and I have to reclaim the respect of my name and come out there. And I don't know. I know that you kicked ass last week I again. I don't think I kicked ass. You got Chargers. I know, but the other games, that my other two games that I bet money on, I lost. I took you the Saints. You pushed Ravens, and then you lost the Saints. Oh, did I push the Ravens? Yeah, they won by – you pushed the Texans because they lost by seven. I think the line was seven. Oh, yeah, you're right. So right. it's not a loss. Okay, that's good. All right, that's coming up next. Guys, as always, we love you. Go on to our iTunes page. Leave a comment. As you see, I read them on the show. Follow us on Instagram, at Sims and Lefko. Twitter, at Sims and Lefko. You can hit me up personally, at Adam Lefko. I'm going to dive into those Instagram DMs for Sims. Peace out, homie. Fedrick would say good evening, and the L-E-F-K-O-E. Man. will say good night. Love y'all. Talk to you soon.